This is turn 46 of I Equip My Heavy Crossbow, and I have begun my war with Arcocephaly. Um, so I started things off with only one magic phase attack, that was on White Harbor here. Uh, because there's already a temple here and two scouts, implying that one of them was already sitting still, it's almost certainly the case that Arcocephaly is building a fort there. That causes a fair amount of economic damage, since in addition to the temple that was destroyed, uh, being 400 gold and these two scouts being another 50, the fort itself is worth a thousand, so uh, definitely a big blow in spite of the fact that it's only one province. Um, he's pumped up the PD here, which is also pretty normal for a fort under construction, but Dancer here has already taken on an army of Hydras and uh, province defense isn't going to bother him anymore. You can see that even with uh, no shield, regular troops basically can't really hurt him. Um, he has an astral shield which is paralyzing them, and he has a huge amount of protection, um, both from his iron skin, his natural protection, and from uh, an additional three from going berserk. Um, and then of course the E9 and then bless helps out quite a bit. And then since he's ethereal, uh, three quarters of the attacks aren't hurting him at all. So since he's not facing sacred giants with magic weapons, uh, he doesn't need the vine shield in order to survive. Since um, province defense doesn't count towards the same HP route as uh, the actual troops, the two scouts standing on their own do try to stand and fight even after the province defense is gone, and of course they die quite quickly. So that was a pretty easy win, thanks to the fact that I was teleporting onto a province that wasn't expecting a golem attack. Here my little strike team of blind fighters and crossbowmen and a little bit of main support um, besiege Tian Chi, which Gath had previously captured. Uh, it's just a little bit of Gath PD here. So, yeah, these guys just get chopped up. So just to look over this minimal mate support here for a second, um, the most important thing of course is that we're blessing up these sacreds because the E9N9 bless uh, massively increases their survivability. And then after that, he's casting legions of steel on them. Uh, that's the one buff that we're doing because it stacks fully with their armor protection, which makes up a much larger proportion of their total prot than their natural protection would be. Um, it also doesn't require any gems the way that marble warriors would, um, so that's going to help make them even more survivable. This guy here is doing just one cast of quickness, um, which is going to help the people at the back uh, move a little bit faster and um, get additional attacks and additional attack and defense. And then he, after that he's lobbing acid bolts, which can help break enemy armor. He's reasonably far forward here, um, which is to basically prevent friendly fire or uh, make it less likely to occur, because breaking the armor of my own guys would be one of the few ways that they could die. Um, but no losses there, and they're able to siege this fort. Um, even without actually storming the castle, we already get a fair amount of income uh, just from owning it uh, because it has such a high population, as all capitals do. In the Evergreen Forest, uh, we've taken a, one of Arcocephaly's provinces here, uh, just fighting province defense. Um, this was the little group that was just ghouls, skeleton spam, and um, crossbows. This guy here has one earth gem so that he can summon a size 6 elemental. In this case it was totally unnecessary, um, but the HP values for my army and the province defense were close enough that he threw it out anyways, uh, burning that e-gem unnecessarily. Um, but still we only lose one ghoul, so that's nice for taking the province. Here in Fast Deer, um, we actually do come across some resistance. Arcocephaly moved an army in here in preparation for attacking me, and it ran into these ghouls. In addition to the province defense, he's got these hoplites and crossbowmen. Uh, the crossbows are probably going to do most of the killing. Uh, even though we're expecting the skeletons here to do most of the fighting, it's always important to bring a small front line like these ghouls, mostly just in order to protect against the crossbows, so that they don't shoot at the necromancers instead. In spite of having um, very low uh, B 
base HP, they start with only 5. They have regular human attack and defense, slightly better than normal even, um, and even a modicum of protection as well. So when fighting these hoplites, which are actually fairly elite as far as uh, human infantry goes, um, they're actually still able to fight them and even hit them uh, through their shields from time to time. And uh, yeah. Uh, my necromancers, or my reanimators rather, were um, uh, fatigued out for a little bit, which is why they didn't run right away. Uh, so in spite of the fact that um, we did run into these guys and lost, we didn't lose anything important, we just lost these ghouls that I had got from that site. Um, the problem's defense, of course, is going to be back, so that doesn't really count as damage dealt, and the few hoplites that were lost are also not a big deal. So, um, if it had been just the PD, I would have taken that province, and it would have been good to not invest more resources into doing so, um, but since I ran into those guys, a uh, minor loss. Uh, here, I'm sieging Gas Castle. Uh, he has uh, one commander set to patrol. I'm not really sure why he's doing that. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so he's done this before, where he sent in a commander by himself. I'm um, not really sure why he does this, because you, the province defense has its own commander, of course. And yeah, my big old blob of guys has no trouble killing them. Um, so this guy's actually set to summon fire elementals, but uh, because there is no... Or these, these guys are actually set to cast flaming arrows, um, but since there's not enough guys in order to trigger gem usage, they're just dropping evocation instead. Um, and then here, I'm just recapturing this province um, from the indie attack, and they're just killing bandits with... Um, these guys here to basically serve as a front line, and then these guys are all just summoning fire elementals. Uh, the Ictiids are fairly slow, uh, which is actually a good thing in this case, because we don't want them running up into uh, melee range before the fire elementals get there. And then the fire elementals quite promptly kill everything. Um, not much to see there. It might have even been a little bit excessive in terms of having three or two fire elementals, but it's just one extra F gem, so it's not a huge deal. Uh, better to make sure that we take the province rather than uh, burn those gems and not take it. Uh, here, um, so we're just fighting uh, again just province defense and we're using sepulchrals this time. And then, as we saw, these guys can do very well if they're not up against main support. Even the relatively hard-hitting lizards here uh, don't do enough damage in order to quickly kill these sepulchrals. And you can see that they are being whittled down. So they wouldn't be able to hold up indefinitely against like a sizable force, but against a little bit of province defense they have no trouble. And, um, let's see. Oh, so the claymen go ahead and uh, take one of my provinces. So I'm going to need to drop something on these guys in order to handle them. And yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same as last time, where these guys are quite weak, easy to hit, uh, but they are relatively resilient now that they've been buffed up with wooden warriors, and they regenerate as well. So I don't think any of them even died. Uh, yeah, no, so no, no losses there for Gath. And then here, um, we are taking another one of Argocephaly's provinces. Um, I found that it's always best to attack along as wide of a front as possible, especially when starting a war. Um, so given that I had the opportunity to do so here, I went ahead and did that. And this province we are um, also just taking with fire elementals, essentially. In this case, our lore was these guys instead of melee units. Um, I actually like using crossbows as a lore, um, assuming that you're going to be summoning up chaff to run in front of them, because the uh, summons that you're going to be using to actually kill the enemy army are going to run past the crossbows, and then the crossbows themselves are only going to be taking damage from archer fire. So unless you're going up against a relatively large number of archers, then your front line, which is just intended to um, draw attention away from the mages, is still going to survive. Let's 
so that went pretty well. Um, we did, of course, burn some gems doing so, but the Flame Spirit in some mod actually generates a Fire Gem every turn, so she'll be able to at least do her summon indefinitely. And it looks like Arco actually had a couple of indie troops there who we take out, so that's always a nice bonus. Um, here in the Stinging Swamp, um, I didn't really have much here. Uh, this is just the province that's on the uh, border of Marignon. Um, it's just a little bit of province defense, and yeah. There's not much to say about Arcocephaly's script here, because it looks like these guys are just unscripted. Or they're scripted to something that would require gems, one or the other. Yeah, so, um, I guess it's just gem stuff. Either way, um, nothing really noteworthy here since I'm just losing PD to it. The only thing that I guess I'd point out is that if these elephants um, need to fight something in the center of the battlefield, like if I have, uh, say, a front lance over there, and I can then make the elephants route, then they would run right back over the archers. So that might be something that I can exploit. Um, but I probably won't ever need to. Uh, it's very minimal mage support for how late in the game this is. And then here in Ivermark, uh, this is just my tomb oracle doing its thing. Um, in this case, he just bounces off this army quite quickly because the uh, Hydras and their fear auras can make it run away. So he's doing his long and expensive buff routine, which gets him very high up in fatigue. And then he gets that fatigue right back down thanks to his Soul Vortex and Reinvigoration. So each of the Fear Auras here uh, is actually generating a morale check, uh, which means that he's not going to have a lot of fun there. Um, he does manage to kill one of these Hydras, which is okay, I guess, and he kills some of this Light Infantry, but it's definitely a much smaller loss uh, than I would like when I'm using my SCs. Uh, here in the White Forest, I actually do lose my um, mercenary company, finally. Uh, so that's too bad. I quite like having flying guys to do a deeper raiding. And the reason shows up right here. Uh, he, just, he just happened to have a large number of crossbowmen. So, um, they were set to hold and attack archers. Uh, the reason that I tend to script that is that against um, province defense, and indies in the early game, but in this case just against province defense, uh, when there are archer units in the province defense, the commander is going to stand behind them. So when you have a large number of flyers uh, that are set to hold and attack archers, then the infantry and cavalry and whatever else is uh, doesn't have a ranged attack is going to run forward, and then your flyers can then jump on top of just the archer squad, uh, which will include the commander, and therefore they have a much higher chance of getting rid of the sole commander who's responsible for keeping all of the PD up. So that's helpful for making sure that your flying raiders take fewer losses. Um, in this case, though, it doesn't work out just because there's all of these additional troops here. Here in the Royal Green, uh, looks like Pythium attacks me and I actually luck out and snipe his commander. So that's always funny to see. Yeah, so in the opening volley, my province defense just snipes the commander. And that is why you always want to invest in uh, Archer PD. Uh, where was that? That was here. So, yeah, that's a freebie. And this is actually one of their larger guys, too. 250 gold. Um, so, uh, that's the, or that's exactly why you generally see when I'm um, uh, using mages as leaders or... You, regardless of what I'm using as leaders, really, you'll see that I'll often put my soldiers uh, significantly further ahead from my uh, leaders. And here, um, yeah, this is just a bunch of uh, sacreds frontlining for some uh, skeleton spammers, I think. Yeah, so sacreds are here. Oh no, these are fire elemental guys, yeah. Okay, so. There's not enough here in order to trigger them to actually summon their fire elementals, so they're just buffing themselves up and then occasionally shooting evocations. Okay. And yeah, so this is the unfortunate thing here. Okay, so when you reach a certain round number, if the... Uh, 
enemy is still alive, then gem usage gets turned back on. And because these guys are so slow, it took them way too long in order to march all the way across the battlefield and actually run up and kill these guys, which meant that gem usage was turned on, and these guys did go ahead and do their summoning. So all those gems are wasted for a battle that definitely did not merit their use. Um, so that's too bad. So now here, uh, these guys all lost, or some of them had some extra gems, but many of them spent them. Um, so I'm going to be gathering them up again right over here just to replenish their gems before I go and uh, try again to siege Ivermark here. Um, here in Small Sea, uh, Arcocephaly tried to attack my underwater province, and it doesn't go well for him. So this is essentially just um, a showcase of the power of water elementals, which are pretty amazing. I mean, we've already seen how good elementals are uh, overall, but underwater especially, they become, or water elementals become amazing. So these are his mermen, um, which he had been uh, recruiting basically just as his amphibious enemies. And he's, I think that he's hoping that these underwater, uh, that these elephants are going to be able to do enough underwater um, just by stomping whatever they come across. So all non-amphibious units have reduced attack and defense underwater. Um, even if you give them water breathing, they still count as poor amphibians. And he casts anti-magic, presumably to protect his elephants against some uh, <clears throat> MR negate spells. So the weakness of water muscles is that they have zero protection in all of their forms. But underwater, they have regeneration, so 20%. And they have, um, yeah, uh, so they can actually recover quite a bit. And then offensively, they're, they're always pretty good. They've got four uh, high damage AP attacks. Oh, and then um, all of the nether spells, the or astral magic in general, does work underwater. So that means that like nether darts and nether bolts and so on uh, can be quite useful. Because a lot of evocations stop working. So here is Merman Route, just because they have very poor morale and they've been fighting these high damage guys. And the statues get crushed very quickly, because while they have resistance to most damage types and very high protection, these guys deal bludgeoning damage, which they don't have any resistance to, and their attacks are armor piercing. And then these elephants, uh, they seem to be in a very small uh, squad, so they also route very quickly just from taking damage. And then because they're routing tramplers, they also crush some of uh, Arcocephaly's guys. And this was his anti magic guy, who even had brought extra pearls under the supposition that he was going to win this fight. And then the rest of Arcocephaly's army uh, gets cleaned up. Um, so you might have noticed, uh, where's that small C, uh, that all of these guys died. The only person to escape was actually the one mystic. Uh, so all of the non-commanders uh, that aren't already amphibious, um, like uh, these guys here, are actually reliant on having the commander um, give them water breathing. So similar to those hydras, the two war elephants here that escaped actually died as well. The hoplites were just way too slow to leave the battlefield because they already have only nine move, and then underwater that's reduced further. Um, sea King's Goblet is uh, probably not going to be super helpful. Uh, it'll just help me move more guys underwater if I need to. And then Inarim, this is that whole big mage supported army. Um, not much to say here since they're only fighting PD. Hopefully they uh, didn't burn gems actually doing so. But given that I have a huge number of um, crossmen in here, I don't imagine that they will.
So lots of buffs and evocation, and yeah, they take that on. And then here, this is my uh, Tomb Oracle. Um, and then similarly, there's not a whole lot to say about this because this is a giant SC going up against nothing but province defense. Uh, this is just another rating force of mercenaries. Uh, this is uh, an almost identical rating force of mercenaries. So heavy crossmen, uh, crossmen with shields and nice armor. Um, here, Arcocephaly has, this is one of his uh, few actual attacks that goes through. He's attacking from this fort across the bridge here. And let's take a look at this army, actually. Uh, it has very little mage support, just a couple mystics and a priestess. And we probably also won't see their script here, just because they're only fighting PD. But it looks like he's still just trying to use the ethereal elephant thing. Similar to his underwater force, though, these guys are in a very small squad with no additional supporting units, which means that any damage they take is going to trigger a morale check. So it's going to be very easy to get rid of these guys, and then make them run over their own troops, uh, since they have to move towards the middle in order to actually attack. So, again, why you put your elephants in the center and then flank with your non-elephant guys. Here in Pythium, uh, Pythium successfully breaks out. And, uh, yeah, it looks like he just chases my tomb oracle away with his fearsome hydras using their fear auras. Um, but he loses a whole ton of units in the process, so definitely not something that I'm too upset with. So his gargoyles here fly. And they're polite enough to wait until he actually finishes his buff cycle. Or some of his buff cycle, rather. And yeah, he has a ring of regeneration in addition to his 10% uh, regeneration from the Bless. So he gets a whole ton of HP back. Uh, more so because he has heroic toughness increasing his HP but to a uh, huge level. Oh, these guys are dying to uh, poison for us. So lots of friendly fire here. And yeah, you can see his morale is reduced a little bit by the fear aura nearby. And eventually, uh, the fear auras make him take too many morale checks, he fails, and he runs. Um, so yeah, definitely still worth it though. Killed a ton of stuff, and I'll soon be right back on top of that capital, I'm sure. Uh, here, my two Markle, just kill some regular dudes. Uh, and then here, I take the fortress by just blowing it up with, um, or blowing up everything inside of it with a huge amount of firepower. So rather than do the uh, traditional Agarthan attrition thing, um, I'm just going to be spamming stuff at him. So since I wasn't sure what all was inside the fortress, as it turns out it's a bunch of crossbows, I was using these guys to just run right in. So between, my, um, <clears throat> so between my huge amount of crossbows and the fact that I had re-scripted the mages here to do more offensive stuff, like Bane Fire, um, I'm able to kill enough of these low morale crossbowmen quickly enough to force her out before too much damage can be done. So I lose only six of my crossbowmen while capturing this fortress. There is another battle in the fortress, which is Arcocephaly capturing Olm's capital. So this is due to be the end of Olm. <laughs> So here he is casting everything, so he did uh, put 
gems on his pretender here to enable Shadow Blast. He's got a bunch of comm slaves and comm masters going up, and he's got his round one starfires going off before he can start casting stellar cascades. <coughs> 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 So this is the big spell. So this is what he was using his Pretender for. Uh, mass Flight. So his Pretender is fully geared, or sorta of fully geared. I don't really agree with the Pendant of Luck here. Um, but everything else, since it's uh, is intended to be like non-encumbering, um, while still providing him with a fair amount of protection. And he also has a large amount of natural protection just because he's a Cyclops, um, and of course he has some Earth to help out with that. So Mass Flight is going to enable all of his elephants and hoplites to get instantly into the mix. And then many of these elephants are also being buffed up uh, again with Body Ethereal. So it seems as though many of these hoplites were set to attack archers, and then a number of others were set to attack rear, and he rolled decently well. Only a couple of the attack rear guys got boxed in by the regular units here, and many of his guys are surrounding the rangers, um, and yeah, even stomping the mages. <laughs> The rangers are actually not awful in melee, they have these axes, they have decent attack and defense and so on, but they're certainly not comparable to the hoplites who, even when starving, just have uh, a great weapon which will help them repel all the rangers' attacks, uh, slightly better attack, and of course a massively better protection. <laughs> Uh, the elephants still do most of the killing here. Oh, and he also put up flaming arrows for his huge number of crossbows here. In addition to getting right into the fight very quickly, um, Mass Flight also enables his guys to reposition, so after they're finished with one squad, they can immediately jump onto the next. And with that, I think that was the last Bastion that Ulm had. Yep, so he is permanently destroyed. And let's check out our events. So we got Curse, so that's not too bad. Uh, unrest, yeah, that's going to reduce our income by a little bit. And we find some Death Gems, so not all that bad. One of our Scouts was discovered, um, and we see here that there are exactly six Shamans, a couple Crossbows, and I'm going to assume a fair bit of Province Defense here as well. Oh yeah, that's a lot of pre province defense. So the amount of province defense isn't actually all too surprising, uh, since this is actually a very valuable province. Lizard shamans are pretty amazing. And then here, um, we're sieging two of Gath's forts. Um, and this fort right over here is just being held down by a scout. Meanwhile, um, the throne fort here is actually being sieged, mostly by mercenaries, but also by a supporting cast of Ictiads and a handful of sacreds. And we're recruiting more Ictiads. We're just using the regular two-resource kind. We just want them for their 11 strength. Um, and then we're going to be recruiting a commander to continue ferrying these guys onto the throne fort. So we're moving our mercenaries to continue raiding right over here. And then we're most likely going to try to siege this throne fort here as soon as we can. Given the state of the game, we can expect Jomen to attack us soon as well, but it's hopefully going to be too late by the time that actually matters. From what we've seen of this army right over here, he really doesn't have anything that can actually beat a tomb oracle, so I'm just going to march this guy directly at them. Um, 
This one is equipped with the Silver Hauberk, which gives protection from arrows, so he's actually quite resilient against even a huge number of enemy crossbowmen, and he has a little bit higher magic resistance than normal from his uh, Amulet of Anti-Magic, and from his Iron Will. So this guy's magic resistance is just stacked. He is really not going to have much trouble against even, like, a Soul Slice spam. Um, and he's even casting Iron Will to increase that further. So... The reason that he was actually given this much mag magic resistance was originally going to be to take on this throne fort right over here, but given um, Arcocephaly's attack, I'm going to have him move further in and then um, try to assist on this throne fort right over here. So this guy, um, Bobby the Bopper, has a shade mail, um, so he's actually going to be able to sneak into this fort right over here and then um, get onto the throne right over here. So the reason that we're having him sneak is that I imagine that it's unlikely, um, or I imagine that there's a chance that he's going to be able to get in, and if, assuming that he does, then he'll be able to sneak and attack the throne fort right over here without Arcocephaly knowing that he needs to reinforce it, so that can potentially give me an edge. Even if he does get caught, given that Arcocephaly hasn't actually shown um, a script that can deal with these SCs, I think that he still also has a reasonable chance of coming out ahead. This province right over, or this connection right over here is closed. Uh, which means that I don't need to worry about him attacking this throne fort. So I'm going to be moving this army right down over here. So if this army does move up, it's going to intercept it. And um, if he instead moves it into there, they can still move back in order to cover the, th the throne. If they um, don't meet the Archocephalians and the Archocephaly doesn't move up over here, then they can also continue moving further down and help uh, invade Archocephaly from the north. So they'll just be able to offer another front, and given the large amount of mage support that this army has, they should be able to take on just about anything that Arcocephaly can throw at me. Over here in the south, I'm actually sneaking this guy into the sea. Because he's stealth, I can't actually see what Arcocephaly has in this province or this province. Um, so I don't know how much more reinforcements Arcocephaly has, or if he has enough guys that can actually patrol. So this guy doesn't have a vine shield, he's relatively lightly equipped. He does have a ring of regen in order to help make up for it, but... It's definitely preferable to have a Vine Shield if you're up against um, an unknown number of enemy infantry. In general, though, Arcocephaly's units are relatively uh, not hard-hitting compared to, say, what Gath has in with his Sacreds, so it shouldn't be too bad, and I expect that he'll be able to take on the Province Defense, Crossbowmen, and Phalangites without any trouble. It's only really made support that uh, could be a concern, and again, Arcocephaly's scripts haven't seemed to be able to... Uh, or, Arcocephaly's armies haven't shown any scripts that would actually respond well to an SC. So I'm continuing to raid, essentially. Um, these guys right over here are um, going up into Arcocephaly's province up here. Um, I, even if Arcocephaly does bounce down, I should still be okay. It's only real, and I, I do want to get him out of the way because I know that this army is going to be moving over here. As far as um, this fort goes, um, I do want to basically keep my thrones, because I'm gunning for my throne victory soon, so having all the points that I can get is essential. So I'm starting to spam out these entrance guards. Uh, these guys have a castle defense bonus, in addition to their slightly above average strength, which means that each of them counts as slightly more than three regular humans uh, when it comes to holding up a fort. So if I can get enough of them, I should be able to hold out against this army, especially if I can clear some of that army out. These guys, the um, crossbows and skelly spammers, are going to be moving on to here. Um, while this could potentially go wrong, uh, it's a relatively cheap group. It's only a handful of mages and a relatively small number of archers compared to how late in the game it is. And um, their script is actually quite good against what Arcocephaly has shown. Uh, the guy casting Destruction is going to do a, a number on the hoplites because they're completely reliant on their heavy armor in order to survive, um, and the skeleton spam should also be able to chop right through the de-armored hoplites. Also, both of these groups are relatively small, and the only thing that could be worrying is these mystics. Uh, meanwhile, we are moving a bunch of guys onto this fort set to patrol. Um, this is basically just um, in case he moves these hoplites and crossmen onto this empty-looking fort. And if he does, then he's going to find himself fighting against hordes of skeletons and destructions and magma eruption. Uh, the province defense here is just going to be providing a small front line, which is going to be um, quickly replaced by the replenishing skeletons behind it. We're going to be awakening another two Oracle up here, because this is where the action looks to be happening. And so, yeah, I want to get as many of these guys up here as possible. 
and as per usual, we're forging up a bunch of gear for those two Moracles. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of it since the equipment's fairly standard, it's just the usual um, frost brand, vine shield, and then various other supporting equipment. And then from here, we're going to be leaving um, most of the guys behind. So uh, these guys are just set to keep the siege up on the fortress. We're just going to be sending one guy set to summon a fire elemental with a small crossbow front line, um, or a crossbow lore rather, in order to take this province, assuming that Gath doesn't have a huge amount of PD or move anything onto it. Uh, we're going to be retaking this water province right over here using this guy, since I expect that Gath is um, probably not going to go chase after this SC um, with his guys right over here, although he might. Um, if he does, it's going to be with something designed to answer it, in which case I definitely don't want to bounce onto his capital and see what that is. So I'm just going to be going for this water province here instead. That's a nice high-value province, and it's going to provide me a versatile um, border with which to attack. If he moves onto this province to retake it, he'll have four different provinces which he could potentially hit. This province right over here, meanwhile, I'm going to teleport a golem onto, basically just because it's in a similar situation where he could attack a bunch of my provinces, and I'm not sure which one, and it's easier for me to just have um, the dreaded homeowners association take care of it for me. We're essentially just marching onto the thrones here, and we should be able to launch our attack on the thrones just next turn. This is turn 47 of I Equip My Heavy Crossbow. Um, so I did make one revision in that I changed the golem that I used to attack the lake here. Um, so instead of using the guy with the um, uh, Berserk Axe and so on, I used this guy instead. Uh, you made this possible. So he's the guy who had killed Gath's uh, initial little Doom Ball thing. Um, and the reason that I did that was that I don't actually need him to be able to last indefinitely, since with the Frost Baron the frost brand, he's actually capable of chopping through these clay men quickly enough to not need to really worry about hitting the turn limit. So he's still relatively slow, um, but he has this AoE component to his attack which enables him to chop through those inf uh, province defense guys right away. And then even once he hits these guys who have been buffed up with wooden warriors to have some protection, um, he's still going to be able to kill them with the armor piercing aura effect from his sword. So yeah, these guys don't have any cold resistance or anything. And this golem does have quickness, so he's able to chop through them quite quickly. Well, these guys will never route naturally. Uh, they do lose their um, army HP quite quickly, which is enough to trigger an army route. And um, these guys had been set to hold behind troops, but since his troops were already in the mix, they uh, yeah just ran right in. And then with the mage leading them gone, the remaining guys just stand still and melt. So that was nice. Um, the Sybil of Hermon ran away, um, and she ran to that one other pro water province to the north. And that was claimed by a tomb oracle, who was fighting the Sybil all on her own with just a little bit of province defense. So she's still scripted to cast her little buffs. Um, but now she doesn't have the claimant to actually buff up. And then since she doesn't have any uh, friendly units of her own, she's actually not going to have um, an HP route from the province defense running away, which means that she's going to stand quite still, casting her spells until the um, Tomb Oracle makes it all the way across the battlefield and gets to kill her. Um, so she did horror mark this guy once, but that's not a huge deal. One horror mark isn't going to uh, cause him any trouble. So here in Tiny Willow, um, this was the Shaman province. Most of the shamans, or actually all of the shamans, did run away, so that's too bad. Um, they all escaped, but that's not a huge issue because, um, yeah, he's just here in order to be able to approach the throne so that he can attack it next turn. And that's what he's going to be doing. And then here, um, this golem was just moving with normal movement. Um, the reason that he ran onto this province here was that I saw all those wolves on it, so I thought that Arcocephaly might have been blood hunting. As it turns out, he was just patrolling it in order to reduce the unrest, since this is a high population province. Um, and yeah, this is the uh, 
let's see, a monster boar event. Uh, so you basically need to patrol out this boar, and until you find the boar, unrest is going to go up every turn. And it looks like he hasn't caught it yet, because the unrest is still sky high. Um, so, uh, having killed all these wolves, Dancer is going to run up, and then uh, from here he can get onto, or back under, uh, onto friendly territory on this province, which, because it has a laboratory, will then allow him to teleport out. And if the game is still going quite, um, by the time that he gets there, it's going to be quite nice to have that option, so I can have another magic phase attack. Uh, so here, the AI just sent out a raiding party of Sacred Hydras, and they easily beat the PD. Uh, same thing here, except that, um, yeah, it's just hatchlings and infantry, but I don't tend to pump up my PD next to the AI, so he's uh, occasionally going to counter raid me until I have all of his stuff locked down. Uh, here, I'm able to actually catch some of his guys, um, and in spite of the fact that his Hydra themselves are uh, going to be quite immune to missile fire once they're blessed, uh, the rest of his army is not, which means that it's quite easy to, or quite possible for the Hydra to get chased away. Oh! He didn't bless them at all. Okay. So while the, um, the Hydra are actually still scary in terms of their fear aura and uh, high HP and so on, um, when they're not blessed, they're not nearly as uh, powerful as they are. Given Pythium's very expensive blast, this is quite a big waste. <clears throat> the Hydra survives, but, you know. So, yeah, given that it's the AI, he messed up um, the scripting, and the Hydra does survive, but the province is claimed. Uh, here in Dovin, um... Okay, so this is my fort getting under siege by another raiding party. So it seems he just kind of, like, burst out um, from here. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm going to be breaking siege with this guy right over here. He's just leading a bunch of blind fighters. Um, and we're going to be bringing a couple of fire elementals along with, and that should be plenty to burn these hydras. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of fire elementals, and then um, some blind fighters to front line. And then meanwhile, we are going to be putting these guys on top of Ivermark, and many of them um, have now been... Uh, they've recollected their fire gems, so I'll be able to spam out fire elementals in case there are any hydras patrolling. Uh, if not, it's just going to be high fire elementals burning through the PD, um, and potentially any skeletons and such that might get summoned against them. Uh, so here in the Lake of God, yep, that was the civil dying. This is just an, um, my crossman continuing to raid, and they are now going to march onto this throne. So there will be yet another throne under siege. Here, my sepulchrals actually do great. Um, so let's check out this fight. It's interesting that Arcocephaly actually has mage support here, but still doesn't actually answer my undead at all. I guess this guy isn't really made support, he's just a water two mage that seems to be unscripted. And then while he does have some crossbows, um, the cold aura here from these guys is definitely doing some work. So you can kind of see here that these guys are chilled, which increases their fatigue over time. And then they also have a fair amount of fatigue just from being heavily encumbered, and also from being in the cold aura, which causes fatigue damage at the end of each round. So this is kind of like how Niffle Giants work. You just have these regenerating high HP guys freezing everything around them. So the crossmen do run away, uh, which is unsurprising given their relatively low morale, but all of my sepulchrals do just fine, and we kill a bunch of hoplites while claiming that province. Uh, it seems that Arcocephaly has sort of given up. Uh, either that or he staled the turn. Um, yeah, so this is Gath once again, kind of just patrolling with commanders, not really sure why he does that. Uh, but my big ol' army with mate support here has no trouble claiming this, and they can start breaking down the castle walls. Uh, here in the Mercs, uh, we come across another group of um, guys here. This is the um, 
This is the army that was mostly a skeleton spam with a small front line of ghouls and a supporting cast of crossbows. So my crossbows had been set to fire archers, um, and given that he has his mystics kind of balled up with his own crossbows, uh, that can be pretty good. Unfortunately for me, the fact that he casts body ethereal also means that his mages and crossbows are going to be a little less likely to actually die. Um, on the other hand, it seems that his mages are like, might be unscripted or something, because the body ethereal thing that they're doing just isn't really a uh, game-winning move, it seems. So the destruction that I cast on his guys, let me see if I can find some that's got hit. Yep, it drops their protection straight down to zero. So phalangites aren't quite as heavily armored as hoplites, um, but they're still fairly sturdy in terms of their armor, and once it gets destroyed, then they're easy f food for my skeletons. <laughs> I'm not sure if he scripted these fire elementals or did he just, just put fire gems on and forgot about them, um, but they're stuck behind the infantry here. Since he didn't leave a lane for his elementals or put the elemental summoners on a flank, they're just going to be applying their heat aura on friendly guys uh, and encumbering them. Or not encumbering them, fatiguing them. You can see here some of these guys. You can see here some of the, his guys even get lit on fire. So some of his guys actually do make it to the flank here, um, but luckily for me, his army is already routed. So, um, yeah, we beat up the Phalangites through basically just better mage use, even though we had the same number of mages, and he had significantly more supporting troops on his side. Uh, my troops were a little bit better, because I had steel crossbows, um, and the front lines didn't matter a huge amount, since I was already spamming skeletons in order to make up for the lack in mine. So, minor victory. Um, here, this is just the guy spamming earth element or fire elementals, just claiming the province with his little crossbow front lines. That worked. And then here, um, this is just a ball of mages with no troop support. That's interesting. Um, I'm guessing that these guys are just doing, um, like, scout. Oh, I just don't have anything there. Okay. Yeah, that was just that one scout holding down the fort all on his own. So I'll need to put something else onto to that in order to actually keep the fort locked up. Uh, here, this is my tomb oracle, just killing stuff. Uh, so yeah, Arcocephaly definitely not really using his mages effectively. Arco definitely easily has the tools to handle a single SC like this. Um, but when he all he's doing is putting body ethereal on his elephants, then yeah, not a lot's gonna get done. The elephants were out almost right away, um, and yeah, this guy doesn't have any trouble. So yeah, as per usual, the regular units can't really hurt my uh, giant sea guy here, so it really is up to the mystics in order to do the killing, and since they're not scripted to do that, the two Markle's not going to have any trouble. Um, and then similar story here, except unfortunately I lose my uh, Woodhenge Druid. So it seems as though the flying gargoyles here are able to snatch him. Oh yeah, he was just here to site search, so I think I just left him unscripted. Yeah, so he gets jumped on, that's too bad, um, but the Tomb Oracle has no trouble handling everything else.
and yeah, we kill a Thurg in the process. Here in the Stinging Swamp, we have what looks like an actual battle. Okay. Um, similar story here in that there's just not a lot of mage support from Arcocephaly's side. And in this case, he not only doesn't really have them scripted right, he also just doesn't have a lot of them. So I just have more mages. His bugs do kind of get on my backline here, so that's that can be a problem. So my mages are largely set to summon elementals, um, and then, uh, yeah, they're basically just creating uh, some elite troops for my side instead of just casting like evocation and such. Although these guys, uh, my water mages, had been actually set to not cast them right away. The reason for that is that I want his guys to get closer in order for my ele elementals to mostly start fighting all at the same time. So that's what those initial acid bolts were for. They were basically just to try to. Um, waste a turn, and potentially do some damage in the process. And once the destruction comes out, uh, again, a lot of his hoplites go to, from heavily armored badasses to no armored regular humans. Once their armor is gone, these guys are just wimps, and uh, yeah, after most of their squad gets destroyed, they rout. And then here, these guys are stuck on size 6 fire elementals, which they can't trample, and which are ethereal. So fire elementals have absolutely no trouble killing basically a near infinite number of ethereal elephants. Like, they can just destroy these guys. <laughs> That was a very straightforward win. Um, I do lose a couple of the blind fighters, mostly from getting stomped on by elephants, and I lose one of my alchemists, um, possibly from just the swarm bugs getting onto him. But I kill a priestess and a sibyl, and yeah, quite a bit of Arco's stuff there in general. Um, so that definitely means that Marignon here is safe, and I can continue using this army to march on in. I had plenty of extra gems, or I load up from plenty of extra gems uh, from this laboratory here and I'll be able to continue attacking Arcocephaly with this army as well. So we find some gold in uh, Gath's province here, that's nice. Uh, we lose some people, that sucks. And we have an assassination attempt, which kills a blind lord, uh oh. Um, so that's potentially a problem, because it means that uh, some of my troops had to be moved around, um, but I still had enough extra leadership to handle it without too much issue. So we are under siege here, and we're going to be breaking out, as I'd mentioned. Um, elsewhere, we are finally moving on to the thrones. So this is the um, almost the last turn, and we're going to yeah be snatching this throne here. Uh, the reason that I kept this golem here um, and didn't use him to teleport into that sea province after all is that I want him to teleport onto this throne instead, because I figure that he can uh, clear most of it just by lasting until the Indies all uh, hit their own turn timer and then run away, assuming that he manages to go berserk in time. So that's the plan there, he's just going to drop onto it, clear the province, and then yet Anderig here, because he's an H3 priest, is going to move on to the throne to claim it. Uh, if he does need to fight the throne stuff, he sh at least shouldn't die to it. In fact, he might even also be able to clear the throne out on his own. Because Pythium here is AI, I'm not really worried about him actually doing anything, and then Arcocephaly would be limited to what he can teleport onto it. So this throne should be fairly secure, assuming that I'm able to take it. And given that it has a pretender type um, on it, I can know that that's a level 2 throne. So that's almost certainly the throne of death here. Um, I currently have 3, 5, 6, 7 points out of 11 required to win. So I'm going to be getting 2 here. I don't know what these thrones are, but since I know that this is the throne of Earth, and I know... Um, 
from looking at the Thrones of Ascension here. Oh, yeah, um, Arco hasn't even claimed all of his thrones. So, yeah, I'm not sure what exactly these thrones are, but um, four throne points is already enough to win. So I'll basically be winning from this throne and then Arco's two thrones here. In addition to that, I'm going to be um, sieging down this one in order to get an extra point and uh, sieging down this one as well. But, yeah, I'm essentially only going to win the game if I can actually take and hold all three of those thrones, in addition to the th th to holding onto all of the thrones that I already control. However, if things do go wrong, I'm going to, um, yeah, still essentially have extra backup thrones that I'll be able to storm through given time, but this gives me a chance of ending the game even more quickly. Um... Right, so this army is moving on to here. This guy is here to siege this fort. Um, so assuming that Arcocephaly either tries to move over onto here or uh, keeps his army in the fort in preparation for fighting off this tomb oracle, he's not going to be able to then get out of the fort with whatever else he has in here. So that's going to help make this throne a little bit more secure. Additionally, these guys can move up onto here to um, basically reinforce that throne. Uh, and that's going to be helpful because the things that are typically good against one SC are... Um, a little bit less effective if they also have to fight an army. Um, this guy with his sepulchrals is going to be running onto here. Uh, we've already seen that the sepulchrals do just fine against even very large numbers of regular troops, so I don't imagine any trouble um, from what Arcocephaly has there. The only throne that's really in danger, I suspect, is going to be this one right over here, just because he's going to have all of the mystics and such that are on this throne able to take it. and. Um, I can't rely on this army here being capable of beating the Phalangites and Crossbone that he has here, in addition to the province defense, since it really is, like, at this point, just crossbows and some skeleton spam. Um, I'm going to be collecting my army right over here, so this is basically just bouncing everything over, although I imagine that if he moves from here onto here, I should still be able to take it. Um, I don't expect him to move from here onto here, but if he does, he'll be able to kill this guy no problem. And that's too bad, but, you know, what can you do? This guy's basically just bringing over some ghouls to help um, uh, cover f and provide, like, a front line, or not a front line, to provide a lore that's going to take the initial arrow fire and devocation. Um, so that's going to help keep my mages safe enough in order to spit out some skeletons to serve as the actual front line. Um, what else? Uh, oh yeah, I'm burning my A-gems in order to empower this guy into air. This is going to enable him to cast Rain of Stones, and then um, I am also moving uh, this guy over here in order to potentially try to intercept these elephants. Uh, so the Rain of Stones caster, or using this guy's Rain of Stones caster, is going to be potentially useful just in terms of clearing out the huge number of mystics and such. Uh, this is my E2 guy, so he can actually also cast around one Rain of Stones if he gets Earth Boots. Right now he's using the Boots of the Messenger in order to provide him with various survivals, so that he can move over these uh, forest and border mountain provinces um, and still make his way into the fort. Uh, between the two, I'll be able to have two Rain of Stones casts uh, round one, which should be which should basically guarantee that all the mages here die. Um, then, uh, if necessary, I can teleport my Pretender in onto this throne, and with no Mystics, uh, the Pretender is going to be very safe. So I know for sure that he has absolutely nothing that can kill a Monolith aside from uh, guys casting Magic Duel, uh, which given that the Pretender's only S2 is a huge vulnerability. However, if all the Mystics are dead from Rain of Stones, then the Monolith is essentially indestructible. Uh, so that's the plan with holding this thing, um, but just in case, I'm also continuing to spam out these entrance guards just in order to help make sure that the castle can be kept up if it becomes just a matter of time. Um, elsewhere, I'm just continuing to attack more of Arcocephaly, or more of Gath's stuff here. So I'm moving from this water province right onto here instead of onto his capital, just in order to avoid any nasty surprises that can come from having a uh, pretender there. Um... This throne right over here could theoretically be in danger from um, Joman's stuff, but Joman would need to actually bring sufficient troops in order to actually break down the castle walls. And given that he has only a couple guys here, I'm pretty comfortable with the 400 defense that this fort has. Um, and given that he hasn't done anything aggressive towards me, until he like actually sees, oh my god, Agartha is about to win the game, I don't actually expect him to attack me. Um, which means that he's unlikely to have enough siege stuff repaired in order to break through this fort, 
and uh, put that throne in jeopardy. Um, in terms of optimal play, I should be splitting up these guys and taking over all of these provinces here, but at this point in the game, I'm pretty much just focusing on uh, securing the thrones that I need to win. Um, and yeah, that's the turn.